Can I go ahead and start? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yes. All righty. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, to pull my slides. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, I guess in your case. Um, I'm Tiffany Richards. I'm a nurse practitioner at MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Lymphoma and Myeloma. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to come and speak with you today on prevention and treatment of neutropenia and infection. So the mainstays of infection prevention, as we all know, is good hand washing. Um, we know that good hand washing um, is the number one way to uh, help prevent infection. Additionally, ensuring that nurses as well as patients um, and their family members are using sterile technique when changing central line dressings, uh, to use clean technique when flushing lines, instruct patients on avoiding people who are sick, the use of growth factors, and then also ensuring that patients know when uh, to come to the hospital with any signs and symptoms of infection. If we look at prevention of infection, uh, the NCCN um, here in the United States has recommendations as far as antibiotic prophylaxis. And they uh, divide it into three categories, those patients with solid tumors, those with a hematologic malignancy, and those with acute leukemia. So for patients with solid tumors, if they have anticipated neutropenia less than seven days and no prophylaxis is recommended, unless they have a prior um, history of herpes, of herpes simplex virus, and then they recommend viral prophylaxis. If they are anticipated to have neutropenia that lasts anywhere from seven to 10 days, then it is recommended that they be placed on bacterial and fungal prophylaxis during their period of neutropenia as well as viral prophylaxis. PGP uh, prophylaxis is recommended as well if their neutropenia is anticipated to last more than 10 days. For the hematologic malignancies, such as myeloma, uh, CLL, and lymphoma, bacterial and fungal prophylaxis is recommended during any anticipated neutropenia. And the reason for that is because um, their white blood cells um, and their immune system is affected by the cancer, they're gonna be even more susceptible to um, infection as well as um, myeloma patients are gonna have um, hypogammaglobulinemia, which is also gonna place them at risk for infection. It's also recommended that they be placed on PJP prophylaxis if their anticipated neutropenia is gonna be greater than 10 days. And those patients with acute leukemia, bacterial, fungal, viral, and PJP prophylaxis is recommended um, at all times. If we look at emerging therapies, um, such as the monoclonal antibodies, um, or um, you, we can see that the NCCN has come up with recommendations with each of the monoclonal antibodies. So for example, um, for those patients with um, CLL or lymphoma, if they're gonna be on a CD20 monoclonal antibody, it is recommended that they be placed on a cyclovir or valcyclovir uh, prophylaxis Additionally, patients should be screened uh, for hepatitis B because uh, these monoclonal antibodies can place patients at risk for hepatitis B reactivation. Um, and so this is just a nice little chart that you can refer to um, as far as other prophylaxis for the more targeted therapies. For checkpoint inhibitors, um, there's also recommendations with drugs such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, um, they only recommend PJP prophylaxis if, if, if they are going to be on high dose steroids on uh, more than 20 milligrams per day of prednisone for more than 10 weeks. Um, additionally, they are recommending that we screen for hepatitis B prior to starting uh, because of the risk of hepatitis B reactivation. This um, just kind of goes over the guidelines as far as prevention of hepatitis B and HIV reactivation. So patients should be screened for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV prior to starting immunosuppressive therapy. If they are uh, hepatitis B positive um, or hepatitis C positive, you want to make sure that you do viral loads um, as well as consult um, infectious disease or a uh, liver expert. 
Um, oftentimes, if they are hepatitis B positive, but they don't have a viral load, they will be placed on Entecavir um, as prophylaxis um, while they are on therapy. If they are hepatitis C positive and they have a positive viral load, then they will be placed on concaminant or sequential anti-hepatitis C um, while they are undergoing treatment for their cancer. If they're HIV positive, we wanna make sure that we're consulting infectious disease uh, who has an, who is an expert in HIV to determine the appropriate antiretroviral therapy while they are undergoing uh, chemotherapy. Another way to help prevent infection is obviously gonna be making sure that patients are placed on, uh, receive their vaccines. Um, and so particularly for patients who undergo an autologous stem cell transplant, they do have to receive all of their immunizations over again. So they will have to receive their DTaP anywhere from six to 12 months after transplant, and they will have to get all three doses over again. Same with Haemophilus B, Hepatitis B, inactivated polio vaccine and recombinant zoster vaccine as well. Now for those patients um, who will need their MMMR, it's really important that they are more than two years out from their therapy and that they are not on any immunosuppressive therapy and that they do not have any evidence of graft versus host if they had an allogeneic transplant. Additionally, you want to make sure that you're uh, checking antibody titers because you should only re-immunize with MMR if they are seronegative. Now for the heme malignancies, um, oftentimes patients don't get revaccinated with MMR because it is a live vaccine. So um, they may be at risk for having uh, to actually getting it. Additionally, patients um, who have young children or who are around their grandchildren, um, for those patients with heme malignancies, um, I know for, I work in multiple myeloma, and so we do instruct our patients uh, to avoid being around their grandchildren for about six weeks after uh, when they receive their live vaccine. And then um, obviously, uh, with the current pandemic, um, the COVID vaccine is going to be important for uh, cancer patients. So what about the use of growth factors? So uh, we want to first assess their febrile neutropenia risk. So does their chemo regimen have a less than 10%? Is it intermediate, meaning 10 to 20% risk of febrile neutropenia or high risk, 20% or more? And then we also are going to look at patient risk factors, such as have they've had prior chemo radiation? Do they have persistent neutropenia? Do they have bone marrow involvement by tumor? And do they have recent surgeries or wounds? And then we're also going to look at, do they have a history of prior neutropenic fever? Because that's also going to influence whether growth factors are appropriate or not. So what are some risk factors for febrile neutropenia? So we know that patients with an advanced stage of cancer who've had prior neutropenia and who have primary of breast, lung, colon, or ovarian, or who have a hematologic malignancy are gonna be at more risk of developing febrile neutropenia. If they have more chemo intense uh, chemo regimen, they're gonna be at more risk. If they're on immunosuppressive medications, um, if they're receiving treatment for with curative intent, if they're also getting concurrent radiation or more myelosuppressive chemo regimens. And then we also have individual risk factors. We know that older patients are more at risk. Females are more at risk if they have open wounds or pre-existing infection. Um, if they have a decreased absolute neutrophil count at the start of the cycle. So not necessarily with an ANC less than one, but they may just be leukopenic. Do they have renal or hepatic dysfunction, their performance status? And then obviously those patients who have poor nutritional status are also gonna be more at risk of developing febrile neutropenia. So what do we wanna make sure that we do if somebody comes in with neutropenic fever? So as nurses, um, while we may not be ordering these tests, we wanna make sure that the appropriate tests are ordered and then reach out to the physician if we see something that maybe hasn't been ordered. So we wanna, first of all, get blood cultures and we wanna get blood cultures immediately. We wanna get from a peripheral stick and then one uh, blood culture from a central line if they have one present. 
We want to make sure that we get urine cultures if they are having diarrhea to get a stool specimen. And then if, um, if they are having respiratory symptoms that we're getting a COVID swab as well as influenza. We wanna make sure that we're looking at their labs. So checking a CBC, getting a lactic acid, a, met complete, a comprehensive metabolic profile, and then also obtaining a chest X-ray to look for any evidence of pneumonia. So what are some considerations um, as far as antibiotic choice? So one is gonna be recent culture results. So have they had a recent infection? What antibiotics were they on? Do they have a history of multi-drug resistant organisms? Do they have a suspected line infection? So are they presenting with chills, rigors? Do they have an infusion catheter, um, cellulitis or drainage around an ex ex exiting line? What is their, what prophylaxis are they on for antibiotic? Because if they're on, for example, ciprofloxacin, then you're definitely may not want to use um, a fluoroquinolone. You may have a different preference as far as what type of antibiotic regimen is going to be play, uh, the patient's going to be on. What is the potential source of infection? What are their drug allergies? What about organ dysfunction? We want to make sure that we're looking at their renal and hepatic function. And then also, do they have mucositis? And so this is our algorithm at MD Anderson if patient comes in with neutropenic fever and they have a hematologic malignancy. So if they have neutropenic fever, um, they are placed on cefepime and usually um, as well as vancomycin. If they have a suspected line infection or if they have bacteremia, we're either gonna use cefepime, uh, zosin or meropenem as well as Banco or Dapto. And then if we need double gram negative coverage, uh, we may add uh, ciprofloxacin and amikacin. If they, have, um, if they are positive for MRSA colonization or if they have mucositis, um, then very similar um, regimens. Um, and then if they have um, a documented beta-lactam allergy, then we may, uh, for neutropenic fever, start them on Aztrianam, um, as well as either amikacin or ciprofloxacin, as well as vancomycin and linazolid. Um, and so based on where you suspect what type of infection they may have um, is gonna guide the antibiotic choice for patients. And then for those patients who have solid tumors, it's a little bit differently. So if they do not have a beta-lactam allergy, then we would start them just on cefepime. Uh, whereas if they have mucositis, um, or if you have a suspected intra-abdominal infection, you may put them on flagell as well. Um, if they have a documented beta-lactam allergy, then we would use as trianam as well as ciprofloxacin and then potentially vancomycin as well. And so really, you're really going to got your um, antibiotic choice is going to be guided by if what type of malignancy do they have? What are their allergies? And then what do you suspect is the potential source of their um, infection? Now, obviously, whenever somebody comes in with neutropenic fever, it's going to be important that we're assessing for any signs and symptoms of sepsis. And so there are some risk factors for sepsis. So uh, diabetics, if they're obese, if they're over the age of 65, if they are admitted to the ICU, if they're neutropenic, and then if they are in, on immunosuppressive medications. Now as nurses, it's really important that we understand what are the clinical manifestations of sepsis so that we can potentially um, identify these patients early. So one is we're gonna be looking for signs of infection around a specific source. So do they have a line? Do they have drainage? Do they have a peritoneal dialysis catheter? Are they malaise? Are they having more fatigue? Do they have um, hypotension? So if their systolic blood pressure is less than 90, if their temperature is greater than 38.3 or Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius? Is their heart rate greater than 90? Um, are they um, tachypneic with respiratory rates greater than 20? Do they have signs of an organ perfusion? So early signs are gonna be flushed warm skin and then late signs and shock are gonna be pallor, cool to touch modeling, and then decreased capillary refill. 
what is their mental status? Like, are they altered? Do they, are they obtunded? Are they restless? And what about their urine output? Are they uh, producing urine or they have decreased urine output? And then do they have an ileus or absent bowel sounds? And so if they have any of those, that's really going to um, really raise some concern as far as that this patient could be going, becoming septic. And so we need to be making sure that we're assessing our patients appropriately. So making sure that we're evaluating for any abnormal breath sounds. Do they have a cough? Um, are they exhibiting any abdominal tenderness or guarding? Are they having diarrhea? Um, do they have any, we're making sure that we're looking in their oral cavity for signs of ulcers and thrush. We're looking at their skin integrity making sure that they don't have any skin breakdown. Do they have a catheter in place? Is there any tenderness or redness anywhere? Um, I had a patient once in clinic who presented with some just um, erythema to the leg. Um, and within four hours, um, the cellulitis had spread um, to encompass like all the way up and down the, the thigh. Um, and so the skin um, infection really um, dramatically increased in a very, very short time. And so we need to make sure that we're looking for uh, any signs and symptoms and identifying these um, early in the process. So what can we expect in our lab? So if their lactic acid is greater than two, we're gonna be concerned about organ dysfunction. And if their lactic acid is greater than four, we're gonna be concerned that the patient is at risk for septic shock. Uh, we can see leukocytosis with a white blood cell count greater than 12,000, as well as leukopenia with less than 4,000 white blood cell count. They may develop thrombocytopenia, their uh, C-reactive protein may be high, their creatinine may be going up due to um, organ dysfunction. They may start to have liver, liver dysfunction and you may see a bilirubin greater than four. Their coags may start to increase. And so we may see an INR greater than 1.5. And then because they may be becoming more acidotic, their bicarb starts to drop. So what are some nursing interventions for sepsis? So the biggest thing is going to be early identification of signs and symptoms of sepsis. And then we want to make sure that we're initiating antibiotic therapy immediately. We really ideally want to begin IV antibiotics within 30 minutes of the fever being started of, um, and antibiotics being ordered making sure that we have supportive care measures. So making sure that we have access to IV fluid boluses in case the patient would start to drop their blood pressure. Making sure that we're doing a focused head to toe assessment and monitoring their vital signs frequently. So if somebody comes in with neutropenic fever, we wanna be monitoring their vital signs more closely uh, within the first few hours upon arrival to make sure that we catch any um, early signs of sepsis. We wanna make sure that we're using supplemental oxygen to keep their oxygen saturation greater than 92%, that we're drawing labs and bullet cultures immediately. We wanna make sure that we're monitoring their I's and O's and identifying any uh, decreased urine output, making sure, um, as I mentioned, that we have IV fluids um, available to do prompt fluid resuscitation if needed. And then what are your institutional policies is important. And then we need to make sure as nurses that we're educating patients and family on the importance of prompt identification of infection, right? So we need to make sure that they understand what are the signs and symptoms of infection and why it's important that they come to the hospital. That it's not just enough saying, okay, come to the fever, come to the emergency room if you have a temperature greater than 100 point, uh, sorry, 38 um, degrees. Um, and so we need to make sure that they understand the why so that they actually will come. We want to make sure that they are aware of the signs and symptoms of sepsis. So I always tell my patients, not just monitoring for temperature, but if they get shaking chills that they just need to come to the emergency room um, without calling, that they just need to come. Are they having becoming pale or discolored skin? Are they becoming uh, more sleepy, confused? Are they short of breath? And then making sure that patients and family understand the importance of good hand washing and hygiene, that they stay up to date on their vaccinations, 
that they know how to properly care for their central lines. And if they have any wounds that they know how to use that and how to do um, uh, um, uh, septic technique that they have are educated about their immune compromised state, that they understand why they're gonna be more at risk for infection, and then the importance of prompt notification of new symptoms. And so I just wanna present this case. So this is a 65 year old woman with a history of large cell lymphoma who is presented on cycle four, day seven of our CHOP. Uh, and with the um, adriamycin being given over a 48 hour continuous infusion. She received growth factor support with Peg Philgrastum on day three of therapy. And she presents uh, to clinic with a temperature of 38.3 and an ANC less than 0.5. She denies chills, but note she's very tired and weak. She reports mouth pain. And on exam, she has ulcerations and the oral mucosa. She has no known drug allergies. And so the question is, is what lab should be ordered next? So we ordered a CBC and we found that her platelets were 35,000. She was anemic with a hemoglobin of 9.8. She was neutropenic with an ANC of 0.5. She did have some degree of renal dysfunction with her creatinine at 1.5. Her CO2 was 17 and her lactic acid was 3.1. So we are seeing some early signs um, of sepsis with the lactic acid greater than two and her CO2 is borderline and she is having um, an increase um, in her creatinine. Blood cultures, uh, both from her peripheral and her central line were drawn. Uh, urine culture was draw uh, performed, a chest x-ray, a COVID swab, and oral mucosa swab um, because she has the uh, most ulcerations uh, were, was done. She gets to the floor. She started on IV antibiotics. She developed systolic hypotension and a heart rate of 120. And so obviously she's starting to drop her blood pressure. Her heart rate's going up. And so we suspect that she may be developed, that she's starting to become septic. She's given IV fluid bolus without improvement of her blood pressure, and she's transferred to the ICU for further management and was started on vasopressors. And so again, making sure that as nurses that we're identifying these patients early um, and then promptly um, doing our nursing interventions. So in conclusion, it's important to identify patients who are gonna be at risk for infection that we administer growth factor support as recommended, ensure prophylactic antibiotics are ordered, prompt identification of fever or signs and symptoms of infections important, that we initiate antibiotics immediately within 30 to 60 minutes of um, onset of neutropenic fever, that we're assessing for early signs and symptoms of sepsis, and that we're educating patients and their families on signs of infection and sepsis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for an excellent talk. In fact, it was very good, very informative, and not only for the nurses, but for doctors also. This is a very good learning lessons you have taught us, various signs and symptoms of sepsis and how fast we can act. So really very good. And we will be requesting you if you can spare some time for a panel discussion. Also, we will appreciate your inputs at the time of panel discussion. Okay. Thank you so much.